Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. There have been a ton of great receivers to play for the Colts franchise. From Hall of Famer Raymond Berry to the underrated but highly talented Jimmy Orr, to legends of the 2000s like Reggie Wayne and Marvin Harrison, Colts quarterbacks, regardless of who was under center, usually had their fair share of quality targets to throw to. But one of the more underrated names, who might have had the best season of any receiver in franchise history, is this guy right here. Roger Carr played eight years with the Baltimore Colts, and is best known for his incredible 1976 season, when he led the league in receiving yards. Today, Carr seems to be remembered pretty fondly. He's held in high regards as a key part of that late 70s offense with head coach Ted Marchabrota and players like Burt Jones, Raymond Chester, and Lionel Mitchell. But back in 1982, that was not the case. Because in 1982, he exited the Colts on just about the rockiest terms possible. He forced his way out, was suspended twice along the way, and had some nasty things to say about the organization that years later, he came to regret. This is the story behind the disastrous end to Roger Carr's career with the Colts. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, we need some context to understand just who Roger Carr is, and why he was so frustrated with the Colts in the first place. In 1973, the Colts were really struggling in the wide receiver department. Quarterback Burt Jones had nobody to throw to. Nobody on the Colts had more than 25 receptions that season, meaning that the top guy on the team in catches ranked 68th in the entire NFL. For some perspective, you had four players on the Raiders that season with more than 25 receptions. Realizing that they needed a receiver to help their first round pick out, in 1974, the Colts drafted Louisiana Tech wide receiver Roger Carr with the 24th pick in the NFL Draft. Carr didn't do a whole lot in his rookie year, never finding the end zone, and he didn't do a whole lot in the first half of 1975, recording just six receptions over the first seven games, and being held without a catch in three of them. But when the second half of 1975 rolled around, a switch flipped. He finally found the end zone with an 89-yard touchdown against the Bills, then followed that up with a 90-yard touchdown against the Jets the following week. Over the final seven games of the season, he had 391 receiving yards, extrapolated to an entire 14-game season, and it would have put him eighth in the league. Signs were there that he was about to take off. And sure enough, in 1976, he exploded onto the scene. No longer was he an under-the-radar guy or a guy on the verge of breaking out. He was now one of the best receivers in football. A three-touchdown game against the Cincinnati Bengals and a 28-27 victory, with two of those touchdowns coming from 65-plus yards out, was a sign of what was to come that year. In 1976, Carr led the league with 1,112 receiving yards, one ahead of Cliff Branch for the league lead in that category. He led the league with an incredible 25.9 yards per reception, which ranked sixth in NFL history at the time. And he was an instrumental part of Baltimore's incredible offense that year. The Colts went 11-3 and won the AFC East averaging a league-best 29.8 points per game. Carr's 11 touchdowns that season, which ranked second in the league behind Cliff Branch with 12, definitely helped out. Carr was aimed at Pro Bowler for his efforts, and was considered by many as the best receiver and deep threat in football at the time. Carr wouldn't quite be able to keep those numbers going throughout the rest of the decade, but while he was by no means a top receiver like he was in 1976, he was still a pretty solid receiver and a reliable deep threat option when healthy and when he wasn't suffering knee injuries. But entering the 1980 season, there were some signs of trouble along the horizon. There's one thing you have to remember about the Colts heading into the 1980 season. They were a highly dysfunctional team. Robert Ursay was about as bad as an owner can be. I did a video talking a lot about Ursay and some of the awful decisions that he made, so you can check that out by clicking the card in the upper right corner if you want to learn more. But especially entering the 1980s, the Colts were not a stable franchise. Ted Marchabrota was fired after the 1976 preseason only to come back a few days later after the players threatened to revolt. Ursay fired all of Marcia Broda's assistants after a loss in 1978, only to backtrack the very next day, which was odd since Ursay never told Marcia Broda he was firing his coaching staff. This was also around the time when relocation rumors became prevalent, and after the 1979 season, following a 5-11 season, Marcia Broda was fired for real. Now, it seemed like Carr was able to tolerate this turmoil, but it was definitely wearing on him. And the straw that broke the camel's back seemed to come later in the offseason, when Carr began to feel homesick. Carr spent some of his formidable years in Louisiana. He wound up finishing high school in Louisiana at Cotton Valley, where he is to date the first and only NFL player from that school, and he played his college ball at Louisiana Tech. He was done with Baltimore, and he didn't really like the new head coach Mike McCormack. Because of this, Carr threatened to quit the Colts, and said the Colts will never get another down of football out of me. McCormack was unhappy with Carr, 
and said on him that if he did change his mind, we're not going to accept anything except complete dedication to making this team a winner. Whatever happened afterwards, Carr came back. Maybe the Colts knew he was bluffing, considering the fact that they had four picks in the first three rounds of the draft and didn't spend a single one of them on a wide receiver. And sure enough, Carr came back. Whatever the issue was, it seemed to be resolved after Burt Jones spoke to him and persuaded him to return to the team. Carr came back, spoke with Coach McCormack, and even though things got off on the wrong foot, it seemed to be smooth sailing for the rest of the year and for 1981. That minor blow-up was taken care of and handled pretty easily. But after McCormack was fired following a 2-14 season in 1981, there was no more bluffing. Carr was never going to play another down for the Colts again. If you thought what Carr did during the 1980 offseason was weird, just wait until you see what happened in 1982, because I can promise you, 1980 was just a warm-up. There were two things that the Colts did in 1982 that ticked Carr off to no end. Number one, they hired former Arizona State head coach Frank Hush to be their new man in charge. I would be here for hours if I talked about everything Hush did at ASU, but let's just say that things got incredibly chaotic at the end of his tenure, including punter Kevin Rutledge accusing him of punching him after a bad punt, and the school being put on probation and banned from postseason play. Carr knew all about Kush, and wanted nothing to do with him or his style. Carr bashed Kush, saying it's a rinky-dink college program. I've heard things about the way it'll be up there. It's the whole Rob Rob program that I don't give a flip for. No way I'll play for him this year. The second thing that the Colts did involve the quarterback situation. After nine seasons in Baltimore, the team traded Burt Jones to the Los Angeles Rams. Jones and Carr were incredibly close. Jones was the one who persuaded Carr to play in 1980 in the first place, and during the offseason, Jones, who was a pilot, would fly to Louisiana, pick up Carr, then work out with him at a field somewhere, and then fly back. The two were tight, and for Carr to lose his friend and quarterback seemingly out of nowhere was a huge blow for him, and it was made even worse when the Colts drafted Ohio State quarterback Art Schleister. Carr was on the wrong side of 30 and wanted nothing to do with a rookie quarterback, saying, I mean no disrespect, but by the time he learns the ropes, I'll be ready to retire. At this point, Carr was done with the Colts. He had a quarterback that he didn't want, and he had a head coach that he didn't want. The only problem? Baltimore didn't want to trade him. Cush said on Carr's comments, as far as I'm concerned, he's under contract and has an obligation to the Colts. So if the Colts weren't going to trade him, he was going to have to find some other way out. And if you thought Antonio Brown perfected the playbook for how to leave a weird situation, turns out Roger Carr did it nearly four decades before. He went to the press, made his grievances public, and vowed that he would play his way out of the city. He said they won't get a decent day's work out of me. I'll moan and groan, gripe and complain, and if that doesn't work, I'll set a record for pulled muscles that will stand forever. The fact that someone would actually say that in public is kind of mind-boggling, but this was the route that Carr was going to take, and the execution of this plan? Pretty flawless. If you thought this was just Carr talking in the heat of the moment, nope. He made those comments in June. Right before training camp was starting in July, he didn't change his mind. He said that he was going to training camp, but that he was only going to be there to get by, and that this was all a part of his plan. Carr said, The Colts are going to see that I don't care to be there, and that I don't have my heart in it. I plan to be a thorn in their side until I get out of there. And the plan seemed to work right off the bat. Carr told reporters after a meeting with his coach, I think his program is just asinine. It's like a college program, only worse. It's a mess. For this, Carr was suspended three weeks without pay for insubordination. That wasn't deterring Carr from the plan, as he said that the suspension will only spur him to work harder, and that he will continue to be a thorn in their side and will never play for the club. Still, Cush was not trading Carr just yet. Cush said, Players on this football team will not be in the position where they will dictate to us. We will not accept that. Carr served his suspension at his home in Louisiana, and then came back three weeks later. You'll never guess what happened the very first practice after that. He got suspended again for another three weeks. The Colts practice in blue shorts, since their team colors are blue and white. And Carr walked out in red shorts. Cush said on the whole ordeal, unless we've changed the colors of this ball club, he was out of uniform. So just to recap, in two days, he managed to be suspended twice. He was trying to speed run his way out of Baltimore. Even though Cush wasn't relenting just yet, he was reaching his breaking point. And sure enough, before the start of the regular season, three weeks after the second suspension, Carr got his wish. Mike McCormack was now working with the Seattle Seahawks, and he still liked Carr, even despite the blow-up that happened in 1980. With Carr's value at an incredibly low point, the Seahawks called up the Colts and acquired Carr for an undisclosed draft pick. Now, there was some controversy that the only reason the Seahawks acquired Carr was so that they could drive Sam McCollum out of town, 
who was a part of the union with tensions between the NFL and the NFLPA at an all-time high. But that's another issue for another time. And just like that, Carr had worked his way out of Baltimore. The plan was successful. As for how the rest of Carr's career would turn out, to nobody's surprise, it wasn't that great. The end to Carr's career was a tumultuous one, as you can probably expect based off of how his time for the Colts ended. He did almost nothing with the Seahawks in 1982, recording just 15 receptions for 265 yards and two touchdowns. He had another chaotic offseason the following year in 1983, when he was charged with assault and was fined $55 for shooting his neighbor's dog. Then he held out for a better contract, much like he did in 1977. After he refused to report to training camp, he was traded to the San Diego Chargers, where he did next to nothing, recording two receptions for 36 yards. That was his stat line for the entire season. Carr announced his retirement after the 1983 season, citing hamstring issues. Years later, Carr expresses that he handled his exit from Baltimore pretty poorly, and I think that's the understatement of the century right there. He said he was blessed that he got to play in Baltimore, and loved the fans, his teammates, and the old stadium, and said on what happened in 1982, I'm not proud of some of the ways that I acted. You live, learn, and hopefully get a little wiser as you age. And now, everything that happened in 1982 seemed to be water under the bridge. Carr is remembered pretty fondly by Colts fans, and Jim Irsay wished him a happy birthday earlier this month. Irsay was on the Colts staff during that 1982 offseason when all this was going down, so it doesn't seem like there are any hard feelings anymore, which is good. However, the career of Roger Carr is an absolutely bizarre one. On one hand, you have his 1976 season, where he might have been the best receiver in football, and maybe put up the best season by any receiver in Colts history considering the circumstances. On the other hand, you have his 1982 exit, where he intentionally played his way out of Baltimore and left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths. I made a video about what Butch Johnson did two years later, where he intentionally stuck to get his way out of Houston, so you can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But he was not the first to do it. Far from it, in fact. Because in 1982, Roger Carr left the Colts on just about the most bizarre terms possible. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9pm Eastern for a chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jaguar9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters to help get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.